Riding at Home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. All right, Claire, we're back with another week of driving at home and talking about the economy. Last week seemed like a pretty busy week, yeah? There were a bunch of new reports out. Yes, indeed. Firstly, thanks so much for having me. And secondly, let's unpack what happened in the broader economy last week. We received the April inflation numbers, both the CPI, the consumer price index, as well as the PPI, the producer price index. So on a year-over-year basis, headline inflation rose 4.9% and 0.4% month-over-month, while core inflation, which strips out the more volatile categories of food and energy, rose 5.5% year-over-year and also 0.4% month-over-month. Which generally so, represents that inflation is still growing, but at a slower rate than it was before. Right. Is that fair? Right. Inflation is decelerating on the consumer side, as well as on the producer side. So for suppliers, the PPI rose a more modest 2.3% year over year, and then 0.2% month over month. Let's break down the acronyms a little bit. So the PPI is the what? The producer price index. And what does it indicate? It's roughly a measure of the input costs for suppliers of goods. So we can think of it as an early indicator of the consumer price index. So generally speaking, as the producer price index decreases, it bodes favorably for the consumer price index because producers don't have that in, as much of an increase in cost to pass along to consumers. And are those the two leading reports that really give the indication of overall inflation? Yes, they are. On a regular basis. Okay, great. Right. And so also a Fed senior loan report came out. Tell us a little bit about what that is and what it said. Right. So that's roughly a measure of banking activity in the broader economy. And the reason why it matters for realtors is because it provides estimates of banking activity, lending activity for commercial real estate as well as residential real estate. So what we saw is just a continued deceleration in the demand for both commercial and residential real estate loans. And then we also saw tightening standards for commercial real estate both multifamily and then, you know, um, industrial office, et cetera. Sure, sure. And and how does the report reflect or does it account for the amount of refinance? Uh, you know, like there was such high refinancing happening through the course of the last couple of years as interest rates were so low. When we look at those year over year, does it take out the the equivalent of the refinancing loans versus new loans? Right. So the measure that I'm looking at, it's net of the refinance activity. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering if the last couple of years are skewing our perspective around new sure. loans this year, because clearly with interest rates so much higher than they were, the refinancing activity has changed. Sure. Absolutely. And no, that's a great point. And that certainly is going to weigh on overall demand. But even if you're excluding the refinance activity, the increase in interest rates has been so significant that it's also just, you know, independently decreased demand for new, you know, acquisition, development, construction loans, et cetera. Right. And this speaks a little bit to some of what we talked about in our April stats, which we released um, late last week, where we're, where you, you pointed out appropriately that, you know, while we're seeing this, this softening in price, the counter to that are the increased um, interest rates and the balance of the two means that where there's still some affordability in the market or some accessibility in the market, I really should say, because it's not necessarily an affordable one. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and, and talk a little bit about what else we saw in the April stats release? Absolutely. So both home sales and prices contracted in April. On a year-over-year -year basis, sales were down 19%, and then the median sales price was down 15%. However, relative to pre-pandemic levels, so relative to April of 2019, the median sales price still was measured 48% higher. So we're still, you know, far exceeding our pre-pandemic home price levels. Overall, the moderation in home prices, it bodes well for affordability, particularly over the long term, because it's offsetting the effect of significantly higher interest rates, mortgage interest rates on 
affordability. Anytime the mortgage rate increases, it reduces the maximum home price affordable to any particular household, regardless of income. We should say, though, that the gains in affordability aren't necessarily equal across the income distribution. So the increase in mortgage rates has more disparately affected lower income potential home buyers. Why is that? Because supply within cat price categories that are affordable to those lower income home buyers is so much more constrained, particularly in the Austin market. Yeah. And so it's all relative. Just to reiterate a point that you made, prices today still reflect nearly four, nearly 50% higher than 2019 pre-pandemic prices, which was a market that had already been on an upward trend for nearly a decade. Right. So, um, you know, the higher the, the softening of prices right now is something that is relatively good as compared to the last couple of years of just hardcore drive, uh, but still making this a hard market to be in, especially if you're a lower income or first time home buyer. Absolutely. Yeah. And right. so we'd encourage agents too just to look at still finding opportunity for those first time home buyer programs, those down payment assistance programs. You can look up DPR. Um, is the down payment resource, which is embedded and integrated into Matrix and helps provide access to programming that might match the houses that your buyers are looking for, just as another tool helping agents kind of match, match make some of the opportunity in the market with the programming that can help support them financially as well. That's right. And I believe we'll be discussing that more in depth in our market shift conversation this Friday, May 19th, if you're yeah. interested in attending. Yeah, and you're going to be featured there with a deeper market analysis, right? That's right. So if you want to hear us unpack this a little bit more, definitely tune in. If you want to hang out with Claire, then you should come Friday. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I don't know that that's a selling point. <laughs> oh, I definitely think so. No, that, that's <laughs> we're, we're people. Um, so one more thing that I thought was interesting coming out of the stats of last week, and I think this is an important talking point for agents and something for everybody to understand is that we're seeing that homes are selling closer to list price, which for me means agents and consumers are getting better at navigating the shift and, and kind of assessing where price should be. Do you, you find that to be true in the data? Absolutely. So the close to original list price ratio is still somewhat depressed in the sense that it's, it's hovering around 94%. So we want to see it a little bit closer to 100% right in the sense that then it would be truly reflective of sellers pricing, you know, exactly on the dot as to what buyers are willing to pay. But overall, we did see a month over month uptick in the close to original price list price ratio, which indicates, like you said, that sellers are becoming more accustomed to the new normal in the market. Yeah. Sounds like sellers are working to change their expectations because agents are leading them well in, in evaluating right. the conditions of the market, which is right. Means everybody's working hard. How are we looking kind of week over week at our pendings and et cetera? So in the MSA, pendings and closed sales are down on a week over week basis. Sales are down. Let's see. Three point. 8.1% and then pending sales are down 3.5%. However, we saw an uptick in Williamson County. So that area has performed very well last week, all positive with sales week over week. Um, What's your assessment just, in, in regards to those pendings being down? What should we expect kind of as a repercussion of that? Sure. Well, that's largely to be anticipated just because mortgage rates ticked higher in March and there was broader economic volatility, what with the two regional banks collapsing at that point, it was Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. In terms of what we're expecting moving forward, though, in our April stats, what we saw is a slight uptick in pendings on a month over month basis, about 7% 7, 7 so that's indicating that we are going to see a continued uptick in closed sales on a month over month basis in May and moving into June. And so we're also sort of seeing that as you've talked about before that seasonal selling season kind of coming to life coming out of the April stats. Right, right. And it will certainly be more moderate, more temperate than 
our typical spring home buying season, but we just have to remember that our market is still very much rebalancing and trying to find its footing amid all of the broader economic volatility and, you know, just all the, everything that's been a, been a real, um, you know, headwind to the housing market, particularly those higher mortgage rates, which have remained a little bit more stubborn than we had initially anticipated. Great. Awesome. Well, Claire, this is super helpful. We'll see what reports are out this week and talk again next week, of course. We hope to see agents um, and brokers out at the Market Shifts program this Friday. There's still plenty of time to register both in person and online. Uh, We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.